thoughtful and constructive approach. Now we move on to our third speaker, Mr. Charles Duggan. who is a heritage officer for the City Council of Dublin, Ireland. He investigates uh, different social and cultural heritage, architectural uh, heritage as well of the capital city. And he collaborates with a wide variety of stakeholders in his work. What they focus on for the most part is 18th century Dublin homes and the stories of its residents, their personal experiences, and their personal effects are displayed in 14 Henrietta Street. This project is a museum project that was initiated in 2015, and it's in fact a 10-year preservation effort, a package of programs for preservation that lasted a decade. Mr. Duggan today will talk to us about the making of 14 Henrietta Street, which actually uh, the museum was inaugurated in September 2018. And also memory and creative artistic works in the creation of the new Dublin Social History Museum. That will be the content of his presentation, and now I leave the floor to Mr. Charles Duggan. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, uh, so I would like to begin by thanking the Heart Drink Foundation for the opportunity to speak today about 14 Henrietta Street. As mentioned, it is a new social and architectural history museum in Dublin, which opened to the public in September 2018. I will consider how the museum's building design and conservation as well as its curatorial processes shifted and reacted in response to information emerging from a dedicated oral history project and how newly commissioned creative artistic responses allowed us to move beyond straightforward storytelling to forge an emotional as well as an intellectual connection with the house and its intense social history. So built in 1748, this palatial five-story townhouse whose checkered occupation reached a critical point in 1911 when 100 people lived there. By then, it had been the uh, townhouse of the Molesworths, a high-ranking aristocratic Anglo-Irish family. It was then the home of the Lord Chancellor of Ireland, Lord Baron Bowes, who was followed there by the influ influential landowner and uh, member of parliament, Sir Henry Lucius O'Brien, and for a short time by Charles, 12th Viscount Dillon, another peer of the realm. Number 14 was converted to the headquarters and courthouse of the Encumbered Estates Court, which was established by an act of parliament in 1849 with powers to sell the bankrupt, bankrupted landed estates of Ireland with parliamentary title after the Great Famine of the 1840s. And it was repurposed then as a hostel for military families and ultimately in 1878 it was divided up into 19 tenement dwellings intended for the urban poor. The 100 people living in 14 Henrietta Street in 1911 were joined by 850 other people living in the street's 15 townhouses, while across the city over 30,000 people lived in one-roomed tenements in conditions considered unfit for human habitation. Vividly capturing the faded grandeur of these once magnificent townhouses and a somewhat casual disinterest in, in, what he, in those he observes, James Joyce in his 1914 short story, A Little Cloud, published in Dubliners, writes, he emerged from underneath the feudal arch of the King's Inns, a neat, modest figure, and walked swiftly down Henrietta Street. The golden sunset was waning and the air had grown sharp. A horde of grimy children populated the street. They stood or ran in the roadway or crawled up the steps before the gaping doors or squatted like mice upon the thresholds. He picked, up, he picked his way deftly through all that minute, vermin-like life and under the shadow of the gaunt, spectral mansions in which the old nobility of Dublin had roistered. Sorry. Joyce's prose articulates one of the principal curatorial dilemmas that we sought to overcome, the binaries of splendid origins and squalid legacies. By the 1970s, only six families remained in number 14 in growing dereliction. The basement and attic floors were abandoned, and many of its 19th tenement flats were gradually emptied or amalgamated to make larger ones. 
While the tenants themselves would appear to have had a relatively benign impact on the building, the evidence highlights mismanagement and neglect by generations of landlords who were intent only on sweating the house for rent. Approaching imminent collapse in 1979, the front door of number 14 shut for good and a period of 100 years of tenement life came to an end. During the following decades, caretakers moved in, intent on reverting its interiors back to their origins by ripping out all the evidence of tenement life. Partitions um, which divided the grand reception rooms into flats of three or four smaller compartments, linoleum floor coverings, multiple layers of wallpaper were all ripped out to reveal the original spatial grandeur of these rooms. While we can thank these Neo-Georgians, as we like to call them, for saving the streets 15 houses and many others around the city, there was another process at play, a stigmatization of working class heritage through this poor process of cultural erasure and the persistence of the attitude of glorious origins and squalid legacies. This erasure is strikingly recorded in the changes to this mid 18th century chimney, um, uh, chimney piece from Henrietta Street. Here it is in 1968 with its tenement paraphernalia, a cast iron stove, a kettle, vases and picture frames on the mantelpiece, all set against a backdrop of florid mass produced wallpaper. Within five years, the same chimney piece and its surroundings have been scoured clean of any evidence of 20th century domestic, uh, working class domestic life, re revealing its pure Georgian origins. Following earlier uh, critical phases of work to stabilize the house, to make the house, and to make the house watertight, our museum project began in earnest in 2015, and we were faced with a number of curatorial dilemmas. From the outset, our project brief stated that the building was the primary artifact, and as such, to our minds at the time, the house, as found, offered up what our project curator, Dr. Ellen Rowley, called an orgiastic palimpsest of peeling paint through wall surfaces. And using the house as found, we would be able to tell the story of its checkered occupation. This, of course, was not to be the case. Uh, little new social and architectural history research on Henry, Henrietta Street had been produced in recent years, and what existed had only been considered in, uh, in uh, had only considered its tenement history through the perceived negative impact on the house by its residents and landlords. The people themselves were overlooked in the historiography. We recognised that the social history of Dublin's tenement dwellers could only be told through accounts of lived experiences, as documentary sources themselves offered little insight into what life was like at the level of the household. It is surely a reflection of the anonymity of poverty and what the socialist historian E.P. Thompson calls the enormous condescension of posterity, that the vast and intent, intense history of the many hundreds of families who lived out their lives in the same houses as the most high-ranking families in 18th century Ireland had until now passed largely unrecorded. We began our uh, museum's project objectless and our knowledge of the material culture of urban working class life was limited. It is not represented in our national collections. It was clear that we needed to engage directly with former residents to better understand the domestic, their domestic material culture and guide our collections development. And finally, it became very clear that the orthodoxy of uh, Dublin's tenement history lacked nuance and complexity. And such was the weight of expectation that the prevailing and narrow perception of tenements equating only to slums and squalor could not be challenged without controversy. One commentator criticised our inclusive approach to telling a more complete history of 14 Henrietta Street while giving primacy to the tenement story as a form of social history gentrification and demanded on Twitter, where else, for more squalor, squalor, squalor. And in response uh, to these dilemmas, we devised a dedicated oral history project and along with thematic reminiscence evenings to further explore common themes emerging from the oral histories, including experiences of childhood, domestic routine, mothers and childbirth, working life, military affiliations, mourning and death. After our first reminiscence evening held here in the ground floor parlor of number 14, I asked the, um, a former resident what they thought of the house in its found state and her response was revelatory. It's a disgrace, we would never have left the place looking like this. As previously noted, we had until this point perceived the um, condition in an archeological sense, that is as evidence of the gradual passing of time. Um, when in fact, what it really represented was a moment of behavior by 1980s caretakers. So this coupled with a growing understanding of the changes wrought by phases of occupation led to a major shift in our approach to the museum and how we would physically represent rooms from different periods of the house's 265 year history, um, physical evidence and memory guiding all of our decisions. So, for instance, we reinstated this two-storied mid-18th century ceremonial stair hall, which had been carved up during the house's conversion to tenements. 
Here, these um, surviving red and blue painted walls of the tenement entrance hall um, were preserved alongside the newly remade 18th century stair hall. So on arrival in number 14, the visitor meets this juxtaposition head on, the house's dual history side by side on equal terms in its very form and fabric. On the Piano Nobile, we reinstated the sequence of interconnecting formal rooms, including this 18th century bedchamber, repairing its walls and late 18th century plasterwork. Letting the building speak for itself, we delicately preserved the communal back stairs and hallways as found, but also as remembered, forbidding and uncanny places with stories of the always open front door um, to the street, the rough sleepers, the house's two unkept toilets for 100 people, its two water taps, the pitch darkness and the slops, and the mothers who diligently scrubbed the wooden floors. We recreated this early 20th century basement flat informed by photographs of Dublin's one-room tenements from 1912. Here we also remember the particular struggle of the house's residents from this time as shared by their descendants, like John Brogan, who left 14 Henrietta Street in 1915 to fight with the British Army during the First World War, taking with him this pocket photo book album of his family in case he was not to return. On the ground floor, we set about um, making a mid-20th century tenement flat, re representing the living memories shared by our community of former residents, informing its, uh, uh, um, where physical evidence uh, um, offered up, uh, sorry, excuse me, I kind of misplaced that sentence. Um, so basically, in this room, we hardly noticed the physical evidence until we began to engage with the former residents. It was hiding in plain sight. Careful analysis of this led us to reinstate the room's 2.4 meter high tenement partitions and to remake fragments from the 90, of the 1960s um, wallpaper and linoleum that we found in the room. We had authentically recreated the physical space. However, bringing this flat back to life and populating it with authentic and convincing furniture and objects was entirely dependent on memories shared by descendants, and in particular the Dowling family who lived in this very flat from the 1940s until the 1970s. And working with the grandchildren of that family, Linda and Trevor, we learned that George Dowling married Elizabeth Buchanan. They had three children, Joseph, Peter, and Lily. Uh, George died of TB in 1949, leaving Elizabeth to raise uh, her two boys and Lily on her own. He was waked in the house. Recalling the impact of his death on Lily, uh, who, this is Lily here, um, her son recounts, his death became a defining moment in Lily's life. Um, she recalls at the wake being passed over the heads of the mourners to kiss her dad goodbye. This was so traumatic that she passed out and woke up the next day in her grandmother's flat, which was across the street in number two. The tremendous sense of loss stayed with her right up until she lost her own uh, memory to dementia. He further recalls that, to bring joy back into my young mother's life after the death of George, her uncle Peter bought her this elaborate doll. The doll was a symbol of childhood that she kept going back to throughout her life. It occupied a pride of place. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm oh, okay, sorry, I'm going too fast. Um, you should have said. Um, as she slid into dementia, um, so as I said, it occupied a pride of place. And as she slid into dementia, she wanted my friend to take it for his daughter. So there is something extremely poignant about the fact that this doll is going home. It was her prized possession. Being both hemophiliacs, Joseph and Peter were kept out of school for fear of beatings. Here they are at their pigeon loft at the, uh, with their pet dog, Sandy, in the rear yard of number 14 Henrietta Street. They became keen pigeon breeders and racers, which is very popular in Dublin, um, and this occupied their time off school. When younger, they slept in the same bed um, in the living room, while Lily shared this bed with her mother in the bedroom until the boys, grown up, had moved away to London. Linda. Um, one of the, grando uh, 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 the granddaughters recalls her grandmother um, and her bed being very stately and had a bleached white bedspread which you dared not sit on. Lily loved to dress make and book she loved bookkeeping and got her first job at 13. A few years later she went to work with her mother in Will's cigarette factory in Dublin where she was to meet her future husband. Lily played the piano and Trevor recalls his mother discussing how they were plagued with mice and how she vividly remembers being asked to play the piano while some, uh, which somehow would torture the mice and send them out, and Joe with a poker would whack them over the head, and that was an evening's fun in Henrietta Street. Lily was also a keen traveller and a member of Anoiga. These are souvenirs she picked up for her mother during her travels, um, which the family have also donated to the museum. 
Mrs. Dowling's china cabinet, which came from this very flat, but somehow ended up in a hay barn in the southwest of Ireland until we retrieved it, now houses Lily Dowling's doll and the china that she, came, um, that she got uh, from her mother as a wedding present. So while we have aimed for a high degree of specificity in the imaginative recreation of the Dowling family home, we have also relied upon oral testimonies and insights of other residents on the street so that the flat um, uh, as recreated would resonate universally. Catherine Winston, who grew up in number seven Henrietta Street, recalls in her own words, there was always a Moses basket up on the chair or the table, and there was always a new baby in there every year. The room was partitioned off there was a hallway come kitchen. Then there were streamers, and you walked through the streamers. They were red, they were yellow, and they were pink. They were all different colors, and you walked through. There were no doors. You walked through the streamers into the sitting room, and there was the table where we ate. There was the sofa, which also turned into a bed that I know now, but I didn't know at the time. That was where my mother and father slept. Then there was a fire, and there was another small table and a couple of chairs. There was a unit, a dresser, with a small black and white television, and then more streamers into what was our bedroom. So my father had partitioned our um, one room uh, into three little rooms. To further inform the recreation of Mrs. Dowling's flat, we organized reminiscence evenings on the subject of domestic life, daily routine, and the associated material culture. This was to form an object cur uh, curation exercise, which assisted us in both sourcing the correct versions of everyday objects um, of home and that our communities remembered. We learned about the weekly cleaning regime that mothers carried out with religious zeal using Malone's lavender polish. We learned that the women would keep a candle um, like this um, with its base wrapped in newspaper in their handbags in case they needed to use the stairs in the dark. Parents would throw twists of newspapers on fire down the stairwell of the unlit stairs, which children coming in from school in winter would use to light their way up to their floor. Plain chamber pots and slop buckets were used by the family at night and emptied in the morning. We were informed that only religious pictures hung above the bed. Uh, it was Catholic Ireland, after all. Um, and blankets with buttons kept people warm during the winter. And the shame of going to the convent at the top of the street for the charitable penny dinners with a spoon around her neck. And the pride each mother took in dressing the mantelpiece, where the most um, prized ornaments and the most important documents were kept. And of course, no self-respecting mantelpiece would be without a pair of King Charles Cavalier dogs, a symbol of a family's Catholicism, we are told. Another important factor we wanted to convey was the community organization and interdependency between families living in the tenements. Um, this instance of com communality was sorely missing um, after families moved to purpose-built suburbs, um, purpose-built suburban houses on the city's outskirts. And it would be important for us to acknowledge the impact of this displacement. So with that in mind, and before the museum opened, um, uh, when the house had no electricity and no heating, and working with Anu, a theatre company specialising in site-specific work, we produced Living the Lockout, a duration uh, uh, during the summer months of 2013. This immersive theatre, uh, a performance happening, made iteratively in response to the emptied rooms of the house's ground floor, set out to explore what it might have been like to live with the lockout, rather than commemorating the events of the lockout through the eyes of the family in 14 Henrietta Street. I should point out that the lockout is a, was basically um, a, a momentous struggle by the working classes of Dublin in 1913, uh, um, who, uh, who had organized themselves in order to get improved living and working conditions. And the locking out was where their employers deliberately locked them out of their workplace. So they actually um, and led to a huge number of uh, problems socially in the city at the time. So also, uh, again, working with Anu, this time in 2017, after the building works had been completed, but not before our museum opened, we sought to explore the lives of three families in 1963, the year in which two tenement houses collapsed, killing their inhabitants, and leading, the, um, leading to the condemnation and reactive demolition of hundreds of tenement houses around the city, displacing hundreds of families who were placed in temporary accommodation. Now, to finish, I want to uh, return to this Georgian um, bedroom. Inspired in part by a visit to the Museum of Innocence here in Istanbul, I was interested from the outset in the potential for creative artistic responses to mediating complex and difficult histories and how it can forge connections between past and present. And 
uh, after a very thorough commissioning process of workshops and of workshops, we developed work with three writers, a poet, a playwright, and a prose writer. And this work uh, was produced by a cultural programmer um, whose name is Rasha Goen, and, uh, and will form part of an experiential audio tour of the house in time. So coming out of archival research and oral testimonies are the untold stories of motherhood. The Georgian townhouse was traditionally used as a place of confinement during pregnancy and childbirth. It is where Mary Molesworth um, gave birth to, the three, to, to three children in the 1750s. And during, while during the tenement days, a house's matriarch um, would often act as a midwife for home births, though it was, would have been normal practice for the first child to have been born in the safety of a hospital. This shared experience of mothers and childbirth was important to convey beyond what is normally considered the metrics of mortality rates in Dublin's case. One of Ireland's finest poets, Paul Amian, responded to the house as an 18th century home, as a tenement house and as a museum. Here she has responded specifically to this mid 18th century bed, which was made for a physician who established uh, in Dublin one of the first public lying in maternity hospitals in Europe. I will leave you with Paula's own voice, accompanied by a film piece which is projected onto the bed, um, transforming it into a talismanic object, unifying the shared experiences of childbirth by women in this house in the 18th and 20th centuries. This bed, this raft on stormy seas. The start of her lying in was the end of mornings at the pier glass. Mouse skin eyebrows, eyes outlined in jet. Cheeks rouged, got from recipes in the art of beauty. Gall nuts, black lead. Mercury, carmine, liquid pitch. Her glued on beauty spots of taffeta and silk. Her drapery, her napery, her blue, blue walls. Birth the leveller pays no heed to class, to kind. Our crossing fraught with peril to body and to mind. In every generation, there are stars that fall, a lost galaxy of nurture with our mother's milk, a miracle we make it here without a hitch, this buzzing hive of life, this golden bounty. Honey of survival in our ancestors' sweat. Salt tears for those who don't survive the quickening. Thank you very much.